In November 1957, Ted Geisel gave an interview to Red Book magazine in which he had just published one of his most famous stories. Now telling where he got the inspiration for the story, he said, I was brushing my teeth on the morning of the 26th of last December when I noticed a very Grinchish countenance in the mirror. It was Seuss. So I wrote about my sour friend, the Grinch, to see if I could rediscover something about Christmas that obviously I'd lost. We know Theodore Geisel better as Dr. Seuss, who wrote How the Grinch Stole Christmas. The story was first published in Red Book, a month before it was released as a children's book. Then in 1966, it appeared as a half-hour special broadcast on CBS every year just before Christmas. I remember watching it when I was a kid. Then in 2000, Jim Carrey starred in a live-action movie version that honestly is really very funny. But my favorite is the newest version. Uh, in 2018, there was an animated movie that features Benedict Cumberbatch as the Grinch. The reason I like this movie so much is because it has a better story than the original. Uh, throughout D Dr. Seuss's original story, we get the idea that the Grinch is simply annoyed by the commercialization of Christmas. And we can understand this. And we probably under or, or agree with him. But this newer version of the story gives us a lot more to think about. In this newer version of The Grinch, we see several different people who have different concerns that are bothering them throughout the Christmas season. The Grinch is struggling with the pain and suffering of his past. We find out he grew up alone in an orphanage while everyone else around him celebrated Christmas without him. And then there's Donna Who. A single mom who's raising three young children and working a full-time job. She's doing the best that she can, but she even falls asleep on the bus. And then there's the little girl who ends up being the hero in every version of uh, the story, Cindy Lou Who. She's worried about her mom, Donna. So she's going to kidnap Santa to ask him to help her mom. Now this is a familiar story. I mean, not, not the kidnapping, but all around us, there are people who are suffering through circumstances that make everyday life, well, a, a painful experience. And for many of those folks, even celebrating Christmas can't cover up or, or even compensate for the trouble they're facing. Maybe those people aren't just around us. Maybe they're among us. Maybe, maybe they are us. A lot of those people are looking for something, something better than what they're experiencing right now. Most are looking for relief. Many are looking for help. Others are looking to replace their pain with something else, even just for a few moments. Some are even willing to lash out and hurt others just so they won't feel so alone in their own misery. That's exactly what the Grinch did. I mean, in every version of the story, just because he was angry and alone, the Grinch tried to stop or to ruin Christmas by stealing every gift and decoration from the people of Whoville. But when they discovered that everything was gone, they didn't respond the way the Grinch expected. Instead of wallowing in their disappointment and the sadness of the moment, they all gathered together and they sang a song to celebrate Christmas. And that confused the Grinch. When he realized that stealing all the gifts and decorations didn't stop Christmas, the Grinch just didn't understand. He didn't get it. And then we find one of the best lines from the original story. It says, He puzzled and puzzled till his puzzler was sore. Then the Grinch thought of something he hadn't before. Maybe Christmas, he thought, doesn't come from a store. Maybe Christmas, perhaps, means a little bit more. Now, the little bit more in the original story, it was just a quick, a quick passing thought that Christmas isn't just about the gifts and decorations, but it's something in the heart. Close, but not close enough. 
Jim Carrey's Grinch gets closer still when he finds love at the heart of Christmas. But the newer movie reveals the true meaning of Christmas. Now, early in the movie, when the Grinch is just in Whoville to shop for some groceries, he encounters a group of Christmas carolers singing in the street. And what are they singing? God rest ye merry gentlemen, let nothing you dismay. Remember Christ our Savior was born on Christmas day to save us all from Satan's power when we were gone astray. Oh, tidings of comfort and joy, comfort and joy. Oh, tidings of comfort and joy. And there it is, that little bit more is the answer they've all been looking for. The answer to the Grinch's loneliness and anger about his past. The answer to Donna Who's worries about her family and her job. And Cindy Lou's concerns about her mom. All of it is answered in this song. Tidings of comfort and joy. True, the heart of Christmas isn't in the preparations for the celebration. It isn't in the gifts and the decorations. It's in the birth of God's Son, Jesus, Christ, our Savior. He was born to save us from Satan's power when we were gone astray. And so with that, God desires us to rest, to be merry, to be happy, not to let anything cause dismay. And I love that movie just because of that song being there. In the movie, the carolers seem to chase the Grinch, but the point gets driven home over and over and over again as they sing the song. I mean, this is a kid's movie. It's a, it's a family movie. It's a realistic movie with everyday troubles, but it has God's answer to everyday troubles. Remember, Christ, our Savior, was born on Christmas Day. And it's those tidings of comfort and joy that bring us to the last of the four Christmas songs that we find in Luke's account of Jesus' birth. This final song, Simeon's song, reveals God's comfort and joy that come through his son, Jesus. Listen to the story from Luke chapter 2, verses 22 through 32. When the time of their purification according to the law of Moses had been completed, Joseph and Mary took him to Jerusalem to present him to the Lord. As it is written in the law of the Lord, every firstborn male is to be consecrated to the Lord and to offer a sacrifice in keeping with what is said in the law of the Lord, a pair of doves or two young pigeons. Now there was a man in Jerusalem called Simeon who was righteous and devout. He was waiting for the consolation of Israel, and the Holy Spirit was upon him. It had been revealed to him by the Holy Spirit that he would not die before he had seen the Lord's Christ. Moved by the Spirit, he went into the temple courts. When the parents brought in the child Jesus to do for him what the custom of the law required, Simeon took him in his arms and praised God, saying, Sovereign Lord, as you have promised, you now dismiss your servant in peace. For my eyes have seen your salvation, which you have prepared in the sight of all people, a light for revelation to the Gentiles and for glory to your people Israel. Now, the connection between these two songs, uh, between these stories, even with our own lives, it is found here in verse 25. When it says that there's a man in Jerusalem called Simeon who was righteous and devout. He was waiting for the consolation of Israel and the Holy Spirit was upon him. And there's the key in that phrase, consolation of Israel. Simeon was a faithful man, devoted to God, but he was painfully aware of the troubles around him. The troubles of everyday life and the troubles of his own people. So he was waiting for God's answer. He was waiting for the consolation of Israel. He was waiting for God's comfort and joy, which he was expecting to come through God's promised Messiah, the, the Christ, 
Now that phrase, consolation of Israel, comes from the history of Israel, and Simeon knew Israel's history, how they were rescued by God from slavery in Egypt, and, and how they eventually rebelled against God when they took over the promised land. From the time of the judges through the time of the kings, Israel resisted God's commands and his leadership, and eventually they lost everything. The kingdom was divided. The northern kingdom eventually was destroyed by Assyria, and the southern kingdom again eventually was exiled to Babylon. They lost their land. They lost the city of Jerusalem. They lost the temple. But then God revealed that this judgment and punishment wouldn't last forever. Through the prophet Isaiah, uh, Isaiah chapter 49, verse 13, says, Shout for joy, O heavens, rejoice, O earth. Burst into song, O mountains, for the Lord comforts his people and will have compassion on his afflicted ones. This is good news that Simeon was expecting. He was expecting comfort, compassion, consolation from God. And God promised Simeon that he would see this consolation of Israel in the Christ. The Holy Spirit led Simeon to the temple where he met Mary and Joseph as they went to fulfill their obligation under the law. And then Simeon took the infant Jesus and he praised God because he had seen the Christ, the one who would bring God's salvation, the one who would be the consolation of Israel. And in his song, Simeon experienced God's comfort and joy. And he praised God for the coming of the Messiah, Christ our Savior. As we celebrate the birth of God's Son, Jesus, we must also comfort others with the good news of God's grace through Jesus. Just as Isaiah promised, and just as Simeon was waiting, God sent his Son, Jesus, to save us from our sins. And we receive comfort from God by his grace through his son Jesus, Christ our Savior. Now even though God had sent him to preach against Israel's unfaithfulness, Isaiah also preached repentance and the good news of God's forgiveness and restoration. Isaiah recognized that this was all part of his, his purpose. It was part of his mission to God's people. And so he said, uh, he wrote in Isaiah chapter 61 verses 1 through 3, the Spirit of the Sovereign Lord is on me, because the Lord has anointed me to preach good news to the poor. He has sent me to bind up the brokenhearted, to proclaim freedom for the captives, and release from darkness for the prisoners, to proclaim the year of the Lord's favor and the day of vengeance of our God, to comfort all who mourn, and provide for those who grieve in Zion to bestow on them a crown of beauty instead of ashes, the oil of gladness instead of mourning, and a garment of praise instead of a spirit of despair. They will be called oaks of righteousness, a planting of the Lord for the display of his splendor. Now some of these words ought to sound familiar to us. They're the same words Jesus read in the synagogue in his own hometown of Nazareth. When he read them, Jesus told the people in Luke chapter 4, verse 21, he said, Today, this scripture is fulfilled in your hearing. Jesus came to save people from their sins, to bring comfort to God's faithful. And as we celebrate Jesus' birth, we share that mission to comfort others with the good news of God's grace that comes through Jesus. We share that mission as we pursue God's grace. That's the example that we find with Mary and Joseph and Simeon. In Luke chapter 2, verses 21 through 24, we read that Mary and Joseph were obedient to the law. They took Jesus to the temple to be circumcised and, and to be named Jesus as they were told by the angel. They also went to the temple to fulfill their obligation for purification under the law. And they took Jesus to consecrate him to God because he was their firstborn. 
Now, they did all of these things because they were faithfully pursuing a relationship with God. And everything they did brought them closer to God by his grace. Simeon was also, as it says in verse 25, righteous and devout. Now, to be honest, we don't know anything else about Simeon. But here Luke testifies that he was faithful to God and his life showed it. As he waited for God to deliver Israel from their troubles and from their sin, Simeon continued to pursue a relationship with God by his grace. Now the thing is, with Mary and Joseph and Simeon, they all pursued a relationship with God. And and as they did that, others were able to find comfort by God's grace through Jesus. This is why Jesus told his disciples in Matthew chapter 5, verse 16, he said, let your light shine before men that they may see your good deeds and praise your Father in heaven. Our faithful pursuit of God's grace, it leads others to find God's grace. I mean, that's why Peter wrote in 1 Peter chapter 2, verse 12. He, he told them, live such good lives among the pagans that though they accuse you of doing wrong, they may see your good deeds and glorify God on the day he visits us. As we pursue God's grace in our own lives, we share God's grace with others and they're able to find God's comfort. As we pursue God's grace, we'll also find peace in God's grace. This is what I find so interesting about Simeon's life and and, and his song. Uh, There in verse 29, Simeon says, Sovereign Lord, as you have promised, you now dismiss your servant in peace. Now, oftentimes folks think of Simeon as being an old man, but to be honest, we really don't know how old he was. What we do know is that he was a righteous man. He was a devout man. He was waiting faithfully for God's Messiah to bring consolation to Israel. Now, if Simeon was an old man, we can see here the blessings that he's received for living a long, faithful life. But even if he was a young man, we can still see the blessing that he will receive in a long, peaceful life in faith. This is the peace that we sing about in in our song. God rest ye merry gentlemen, let nothing you dismay. As we pursue God's grace, we find God's peace. And so we need not let anything cause dismay throughout our lives. Now, are we going to experience troubles? Well, sure. But we can find peaceful rest in God because Jesus, Christ our Savior, was born on Christmas Day. Grace and peace, they just go together, right? I mean, in just about every letter he wrote to just about every church, Paul wrote over and over again this phrase. Like in Romans 1, verse 7, Grace and peace to you from God our Father and from the Lord Jesus Christ. That's why Jesus came. And this is how and why we can comfort others, old or young, troubled or not. As we celebrate the birth of Jesus, we can comfort others because we have found peace in God's grace. And so we must reveal God's grace. We must reveal God's grace to comfort others because that's exactly what God did. And that's why God did it the way he did it, through his son Jesus. I mean, listen to Simeon's song again, verses 29 through 32. Sovereign Lord, as you have promised, you now dismiss your servant in peace. For my eyes have seen your salvation, which you have prepared in the sight of all people a light for revelation to the Gentiles and for glory to your people Israel. As Simeon praises God for fulfilling the promise he made, he tells us that that he's God's servant who has seen God's salvation. In his song, Simeon recalls more of God's words through the servant, uh, the prophet Isaiah. Uh, Isaiah chapter 49, uh, verse 6. God says, it is 
too small a thing for you to be my servant to restore the tribes of Jacob and bring back those of Israel I have kept. I will also make you a light for the Gentiles, that you may bring my salvation to the ends of the earth. Now, Isaiah 49, it's the second of four uh, servant songs that, that Isaiah records. Songs about the coming servant of God, the Messiah, the Christ, who would restore God's people, who would save God's people. Now, if we go back through Israel's his history and, and consider the extent of Israel's sinful rebellion against God, We'd probably be shocked that God's chosen people had worshipped false idols. They'd sacrificed their own children to false gods. They had taken advantage of each other, their own people cheating each other in business and abusing widows and orphans. Yet with all those sins, God promised to console Israel, to restore them if they would repent and be faithful if that wasn't enough grace, God said that his servant, the Messiah, who is coming, he'd do more than that. It says it's too small a thing for him to restore Israel. He would also save the Gentiles, the whole world. And here, with the baby Jesus in his arms, Simeon reveals that God has fulfilled his promise. In verses 30, uh, through 32, Simeon says, For my eyes have seen your salvation, which you've prepared in the sight of all people, a light for the revela a revelation to the Gentiles and for glory to your people Israel. God has revealed that he sent his son Jesus to save everyone who will put their faith in him. It was too small a thing for the Christ to save only faithful Israel. So Jesus has come to save all all who believe. Jesus himself said in John chapter 3 verses 16 through 18, For God so loved the world that he gave his one and only Son, that whoever believes in him shall not perish but have eternal life. For God did not send his Son into the world to condemn the world, but to save the world through him. Whoever believes in him is not condemned, but whoever does not believe stands condemned already because he has not believed in the name of God's one and only Son. Jesus is the consolation of Israel. Jesus is the consolation of all who will believe. These are truly tidings of comfort and joy. And as we celebrate the birth of the Son of God, Jesus Christ our Savior, we must reveal God's grace for the salvation of all who will believe. Now, I know that Christmas was just a couple days ago, but will you help comfort this troubled world with the good news of God's grace through Jesus? I mean, if you're a disciple of Jesus, that's our mission. Paul tells us that not only is it our mission, but it's part of our praise and worship of God. He writes in 2 Corinthians chapter 1, verses 3 and 4, Praise be to the, to the God and Father of our Lord Jesus Christ, the Father of compassion and the God of all comfort, who comforts us in all our troubles, so that we can comfort those in any trouble with the comfort we ourselves have received from God. Simeon praised God for the peace and salvation that God offers by His grace, not only to Israel, but to all who will believe. And that's why we celebrate the birth of Jesus. God sent His Son, Jesus, Christ, our Savior, who was born on Christmas Day, to save us all from Satan's power when we are gone astray. And so we celebrate with tidings of comfort and joy. But if you haven't put your faith in Jesus Christ, our Savior, you don't yet know the comfort, the, the joy, the peace, the consolation, the forgiveness, salvation that God offers by His grace.
Now, if that's the case, I urge you to accept Jesus as your Lord and Savior as soon as possible. If you believe that Jesus is God's Son, who died on the cross to forgive our sins and who rose again to give us new life through faith in Him, if you'll repent and turn back to God, if you'll join with Jesus by being baptized for the forgiveness of your sins, you will be saved. You'll be forgiven. You'll receive the Holy Spirit who will give you God's comfort, joy, and peace. Now, if you have any questions about anything that I've said, I invite you to contact me at Athens Church of Christ, and we'll get together and work through all of that as soon as possible. But until then, would you please pray with me? Father God, you know that we live in a dark, sinful world where we've got trouble all around us. We've, we've got trouble among us. We even have trouble within us. God, I praise you that you have fulfilled your promise to rescue the faithful by sending Jesus. Lord, as we finish this time of celebration of the birth of Jesus, I pray that you'll give us, that you'll give the church the faith and the strength that we need to comfort others with the good news of your grace and forgiveness through Jesus. I also pray for those who've just heard this good news. Father, give them the faith that they need to respond, to accept Jesus as Lord and Savior. And I pray all of this in Jesus' name. Amen.